Thank you for joining us for the ACUA and IDEA Special Interest Group. Our topic today is I Have Idea, Now What? Um, Strategies for a Successful and Sustainable Analytics Practice. This webcast is worth one hour of NASBA CPE. In order to receive the NASBA CPE, you must be logged in for the entire hour, answer all three polling questions, and complete the brief evaluation at the end of the webcast. We are recording the session. Uh, the session slides and recording should be sent out tomorrow. Qualifying attendees will receive their CPE certificate within the week. Um, our presenter today is Jeremy Compton with EKD Forensic Evaluation Services. Jeremy specializes in data analytics with applications in fraud prevention and detection, risk assessment, and business intelligence. Uh, throughout the webcast, you may um, submit questions on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will answer those at the end. I will let Jeremy take over from here. All right. Thanks, Lindsay. I appreciate it. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast. Uh, as Lindsay mentioned, we're going to be talking about strategies for successful and sustainable analytics practices, how to really get started going uh, with analytics. And I think this will be beneficial to everyone that's in attendance, whether you're brand new to analytics or whether you're kind of getting started with analytics, and hopefully uh, even provide some of you that have been doing this for a while, maybe some new ideas and ways to uh, strategies to get even more success out of your analytics practice. Uh, as Lindsay mentioned, uh, the slides will be available uh, to you. Uh, after the webinar, and I will also provide uh, some bonus content in there that lists some uh, various ideas to get you started as to places that you can, you know, begin using analytics uh, and some how-to guides to help you get started in that regard. Hopefully that will be beneficial to everyone. As we get started with today's webcast, I am curious as to some of the objectives uh, that, that the audience has today and what you're looking to get out of this webinar. Um, if you'd be interested or willing to go ahead and share that either in the chat with the organizers window or in the questions tab uh, of your uh, GoToWebinar toolbar, uh, just give me a little bit more context as to what you're looking to get out of this so I can try to tailor it as best as I can as we go along. And obviously you're willing uh, or you're able to ask any questions and I'm more than happy to field those as we go throughout the webinar where it's, uh, where it's appropriate and then at the end of the webinar as well. So I look forward to hearing from you as to what you're looking to get from today's webinar as we go throughout. So we're going to start off with a bit of a demonstration and really it's to drive home the point as to why this is so effective and why we're even having this conversation. And historically as accountants or auditors, uh, we've done uh, something that everybody's quite familiar with and that's sampling. And not that there's necessarily anything wrong with sampling. I definitely believe that it has its place and its purpose in the world, uh, especially in the world of auditing. It's something that uh, we do a fair amount of. But as it comes to the evaluation of overall data sets and addressing some of the bigger risks that may be out there, maybe fraud risk, uh, looking for operational decision making, and really looking to get more out of our data, I, I think it's very challenging if we take a sampling approach to that. I'm going to just kind of use this as a moment to demonstrate why. On the screen, uh, there is a message on the screen behind all the black boxes. There are a thousand of the boxes. And essentially, we're going to pull our traditional audit-based sample of 30. And the sample of 30 you can see right here, we can see that it's really hard to understand what this message is. I mean, we've just pulled a sample of 30 out of 1,000, which is probably a higher proportion than most people uh, would ever pull. And we still really don't have any idea what the data set truly is. If we up that sample to 50, you can see that it's still a bit of a challenge, uh, that we have a little bit more of the message, but we really still don't know what is the big picture of the data. Uh, if we go up to a sample of 10%, probably a sample larger than virtually anybody on, uh, has typically pulled as it relates to a data set, uh, we still don't have an idea, and just for demonstration purposes, up to 20%. We really don't have any great idea as to what's going on in this message, what it really says. And that's a challenge to us, and hopefully it's a challenge that we can all identify, uh, is the fact that even when we pull a 20% sample, we really don't know what we're looking at in our data or what our data really tells us. It's only when we look at 100% of the data, the entirety of the data set, do we really get a full grasp as to what the big picture is within the data set, what all, about the, what all out there is available to us, and, and what we should be learning from the data. I know a few people here have already mentioned that they're looking for um, you know, different ways to use analytics as it relates to fraud. 
And really, this is uh, this, this really underscores the importance of using analytics for fraud. Because if we're only looking at a data set or a sample of maybe 30 to 50 or 10 percent, it's going to be really hard to find fraud. Because most fraud cases, at least in my experience and those that I, I've seen studied, aren't typically the majority of your transactions. In fact, I can think of one off the top of my head that was a multi-million dollar fraud that took less than 300 transactions to occur, uh, which was less than a tenth of a percent of the transactions out there. So we want to make sure that we're looking at the entirety of the data set so we fully see what's out there in our data and what's really important to us as it relates to our data. Another reason that it's important that we go ahead and we start using analytics and taking this big picture, 100 percent approach uh, to our analysis is the impact that computerization is really having. And I think it's incredibly important uh, as it relates to us as accountants and auditors. If you look on the screen here, down toward the bottom of this chart, this is the probability that computerization will lead to job losses over the next couple decades. And you can see that accountants and auditors are at a 0.94% uh, probability, which is a pretty good likelihood um, as it relates to probabilities. But really, uh, from my perspective, I think it's really important that we're not just relying on computerization. I think that's really an opportunity that we have uh, within our organization, that we have this opportunity uh, to use computerization to drive extra value to our organization. And I think analytics is going to help us do that. Now, one of the big things that's really important as we move throughout analytics and, and we start this conversation today is figuring out what exactly do we mean by analytics. And analytics is similar to the, the term big data, where you can Google the definition and you can find something that supports what you want it to be, right? That's the great thing about technology today, is we can always find somebody that agrees with us. Uh, but the context with which I'm going to be talking about analytics today, and we're really going to approach this, uh, you can see it's on the screen here. Really, it's focused on two things. But it's procedures that are going to help us get useful information from our data. And I think that's really critical. We have to be getting useful information. Um, don't get me wrong. I can analyze data all day for fun. Uh, but that's not providing value to my organization. So we need something that's useful. And then from there, we have to be answering a strategic question. So, as I see the various places where individuals have mentioned that they're looking to apply uh, analytics in their organization, what I would challenge you with right out of the gate today is what is the strategic question or what are these strategic questions that you're looking to answer in, your, uh, in that area? So if it's in grants compliance, if it's in fraud auditing, um, if it's in you know, financial statement assessment, whether it's variance analysis or whether it's fraud, you know, fraud focused, what are the specific strategic questions that you're looking to answer? Because as you can start to you know, ask those questions, from there you can then use the framework that we'll talk about uh, later on in the presentation to really help you hone in on the right test to apply in that specific area. But it all starts with a strategic question. And I think that's very important. It's something that uh, a lot of times we kind of overlook because we're so excited to get into the data. I I'm guilty of that as well from time to time. I just want to get into the data. I want to analyze it. I want to run the analytics and get the useful information. But if we don't have that strategic question that's really guiding us, it's really going to be a challenge for us uh, to figure out, well, what really does this mean and how do we use it within our organization? Now, as we go throughout the presentation today, uh, some of the things that I want to hit on as we go throughout the session, some of the key elements of success as it relates to building a successful analytics program or successfully applying analytics, uh, will hit some of the challenges that you're going to face and hopefully give you some ideas to overcome those challenges. We'll touch on a few common questions that I hear folks asking, uh, whether it's at conferences that I've spoken at or organizations that I've worked with or questions I've heard internally in our own organization here. Uh, and we'll then walk through a framework uh, that can hopefully help you apply this within the various applications or various areas in your organization, give you some closing thoughts, and then go through Q&A. Uh, some of the, the you know, things that people want to get out of this today, you know, looking for the right, um, you know, the right analytics team, some of an overview of that. We'll be talking about those things. You know, different ways to apply it, uh, specifically whether it's fraud-related or specific analytical models. Uh, some of that will be in the bonus content that you'll get after the presentation as well that will kind of take the framework we're going to talk about and give you specific applications 
and hopefully you'll be able to take that and apply it directly in your organization is the overall objective of that content. So we're going to start off with the elements of success. So what are those key things that you really need to be thinking about as you look to start a successful program or as, a, as you look to successfully use analytics within your organization? And there are really five elements that we need to focus in on. Uh, and those elements are the vision as it relates to the analytics, what is your approach to analytics, your goals, what's the team that you're going to be working with and designing and building and recruiting, and then how do we really sell the vision? And a lot of those, uh, the approach, goals, and team will really work together with us to help us sell the vision. Uh, but they're very important elements as it relates to getting success in analytics. Now, before we get too far in, as Lindsay mentioned at the top of the session, uh, we are going to have some polling questions throughout. So right now, I'll turn it over to Lindsay for our first polling question. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, our first polling question, as you can see, is just to make sure that you guys are paying attention. So our first confirmation word is idea. Please go ahead and select idea from your list of words. And I will leave this up here for a about 30 seconds so that we can um, just make sure everybody is following with us. Again, I see a lot of you are submitting questions and what you're hoping to get out of the webcast. If you have any questions, um, go ahead and enter them at any time. And I'll give you another few seconds to go ahead and vote for our confirmation word. And all right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Thank you. And all right, back thank to you, you. Jeremy. I appreciate it. All right, so the first element of success as it relates to uh, an analytics program is vision. And I realize this is uh, probably a bit more perhaps touchy-feely than, uh, than we typically talk about as auditors. Um, and just as a point of reference, I am an accountant, started in audit, uh, been in forensics and uh, analytics the majority of my career, but I am an accountant by trade and training. But the first thing we really have to have is a vision. So what is it that we're really trying to get out of our analytics, uh, either our analytics practice within the organization, maybe we're looking at building something that works you know, organization-wide, or maybe it's just how we're going to apply it internally in internal audit. And this is one of the very first things that I talk with organizations about that are trying to get going with analytics, is what's your overall picture for where you want to be? Uh, and it's, it's an important exercise to do, and I, I want to make sure that we don't overlook that, is thinking about what exactly are we looking to get from using analytics in our organization? Are we trying to you know, add efficiencies? Are we trying to become more effective? Are we trying to do the classic more with less approach because we know that our resources are constrained? Uh, are, are we trying to address maybe a risk or meet an objective that we've just not been able to effectively meet or address in the past. And it really helps us start to think more with the end in mind. So where are we going on this great journey that is analytics? And really take some, you know, some of the action steps that can help get you there is thinking about what are the benefits that analytics will provide you personally? What will the benefits that they'll provide your department? What are the benefits that they'll provide your organization? Take a second and actually write those out. You know, think through, if we were to successfully launch analytics internally in our department or in our organization, what does successfully launched even look like? How do we know when we have successfully incorporated analytics in our organization? You know, one of the things that we want to make it a part of is part of the culture. We don't want it to be something else that we have to do. We want to make sure that it's part of our culture. So what does it look like once we're there? You know, one approach that I've seen to this, and it, it's foreign to a lot of us, um, and I, I will readily admit I never would have thought of doing this, but I find it very useful now, is draft a mock press release. You know, what does it look like when you launch this new program, uh, when you've successfully, you know, told the world that we use analytics and here's what it does for us. You know, think about that. I'm not saying send it to the presses or send it to the AP, but I'm just saying internally the exercise really forces you to think about what is that vision that you have uh, that you have in mind. From there, you then need to focus on your overall approach, and this is going to give you the direction, purpose, and intent with which you're going to move forward in analytics, and it's really going to help you sell the project internally. I mean. 
as you work through your approach, you know, think about what are the various business processes that you're looking to include in analytics. Is it accounts payable? Is it grants compliance? Um, is it athletics and you know academics around the athletic side? Is it you know ticketing and the use of tickets? Uh, maybe it's revenue maximization in the ticketing aspect of your athletics. Um, is it your purchasing cards? Is it your general ledger? You know what are the business processes that you're truly looking to to apply analytics toward, and what are you looking to get out of that? What are the specific controls that you're looking to test? Uh, what's some of the data that you're going to need? How often are you going to be performing the testing? You know, really break all of this down. You know, who's going to get the results once you have it? And really almost thinking through this from a full-blown planning phase before you ever run an analytic, actually spell out the process for what it looks like from start to finish. And it's really going to help you identify as you go what challenges might you encounter. Now, we're going to talk about some of the most common challenges but inevitably, you're going to, as you think through each of these business process areas, you're going to come up with what are the areas, what are the challenges that you're going to face in each of those, and it'll really help you uh, formulate a plan for addressing those challenges as you go, and that's going to be important to really getting you that successful application of analytics uh, within the organization. So we want to make sure that we have a clearly defined approach, just like we would on any audit that we're going to perform. I mean, we're not going to say, hey, we're going to go perform an audit in accounts payable, and we don't really have a plan, we don't really have a process, we're just going to go audit accounts payable. You know, we have a clearly defined approach. The same needs to be true for analytics. The next is we need to have our goals. You know, what is our overall why behind this program, behind the application of analytics? You know, one of the things that this can help us do is communicate back to management what's the overall ROI. Um, you know, it's really hard at times to calculate an ROI on an analytics um, you know, program or the application of analytics, especially where we're trying to mitigate risk, right? It's really difficult for us to come back in there and say, well, we, you know, we know for a fact that we stopped $500,000 in fraud. We may or may not be able to do that, but as we think through the compliance aspects, we think through the different things, you know, if we look at known losses and we're trying to, you know, reduce those, maybe we can start to set some metrics that will help us identify that overall ROI. When we have those goals, again, this is going to build back into that selling of the vision that we're going to talk about in a moment because it tells management why we're even doing this. Um, and, and the goals need to be really into three different categories. The first, what's the specific goal for this analytic? You know, what are we trying to accomplish with this specific procedure? Secondarily, what are our program goals? By using analytics in the short term, we're hoping to accomplish X. What are those goals that we're looking to accomplish in the short term? I would recommend that effectiveness is one of those goals. And then in the long term, what is your overarching goal that you're trying to accomplish? Uh, by launching analytics in your organization, that's where the efficiency side comes in. You know, a lot of folks want to say it's efficiency first, effectiveness second. That's actually pretty well backwards. It will take additional time to set it up in the front end, but you're going to get effectiveness quickly. Efficiency will come later, but that is one of the long-term goals that we want to make sure that we focus in on, and that's going to be communicated to management as well. The next key element is a team got to have a great team. If we don't have a great team, it's going to really be hard to successfully use analytics. If we have individuals that aren't sold on our overall vision and approach, they're going to sabotage the program. Um, and it's going to be really important that the overall team morale um, is, is visible because it's going to be visible to management. And if they see that everybody is down on the fact that we're using analytics and discouraged and frustrated, it's not going to work. Now, as it relates to who should you have on your team, uh, it's important to have a good mix of the technical knowledge and the technology expertise. Uh, it's not you don't have to have one person that's necessarily spectacular in both. Um, you know, as we're looking for forming an analytics team, we want to make sure that we have a good fit of individuals that know how to use the software and individuals that know the business processes. Now, if we can find that superstar that can do both, great. That said, you should not build an entire program on that one individual because as soon as the grass is greener on the other side and they decide to leave, I hope it never happens, but inevitably, inevitably it seems to happen more often than not, we don't want our entire program to leave with them. So that collaborative approach can be very beneficial. 
Um, you, you may need to hire somebody. Uh, you may need to, you know, look in different departments, not necessarily auditing and accounting, and find somebody that's a bit more tech savvy uh, and has that creative mindset and bring them in. I know personally on our team, we've actually recruited people from marketing because they have that right mix of expertise that we were looking for, not necessarily an accounting background, but added that other that new perspective that we really uh, were looking for at that time. So look outside of your department. Can you cross and train some of your IT members or your finance members on the IT system so they can actually help uh, be a translator to IT as we talk about our challenges in just a minute. And, and then really evaluate your team, um, you know, as you're growing it and where you stand now, what is it that you're missing? Um, do you miss from a skill set? Do you miss somebody with the technical knowledge or do you miss somebody with the technology expertise? You know, figure out what it is that you're missing and go look for that particular skill set. You don't have to find one person that can do it all. Typically, it's the collaborative approach that's even better. Finally, the last thing is going to be selling the vision and you've got to be able to sell the vision to management, to the stakeholders and to the business process hunters. Otherwise, it's going to be an uphill battle. Uh, you want to make sure that when you're doing this, you put on your marketing hat and communicate in business terms. If you can, include the financial data, the ROI data where possible, and really help demonstrate the value to the organization as a whole and to the very specific business process owners as you go. Once they see the value, you're going to get their support. And if you can get business process owner support and all of a sudden you've got the middle level of the organization is all in on analytics, it's going to help at the management level as well as far as getting those um, stakeholders on board. So from those key elements, obviously we're going to face challenges. Uh, in fact, many of you on here have probably already faced challenges and you're trying to figure out, well, how do we, you know, how do we deal with those challenges? So some of the challenges that we're going to, we're going to talk about here uh, are, are five of the most common that I encounter and from talking with organizations that have been encountered. We're going to talk about starting, you know, planning and strategy, getting the stakeholders on board. How exactly do we do that? What are the IT-related challenges, the cultural challenges, and then finding the right team members because that is going to be critical. You know, one of the biggest challenges that I see organizations face as it relates to getting started with analytics is truly that they just don't know where to start. You know, they're really trying to figure out, well, what area should I start in? And you know, we can spend all day and all night and all week and all month trying to figure out what would potentially be the best at a point we have to start. Um, you know, we have to, we have to you know, take the software developer's approach and figure out what's that minimum viable product and just get something out there and get it started and, and recognize it's version 1. It's 1.0. We're going to have a 2. We're going to have a 3. We're going to have a 4. It's going to get better with time. But if we don't start, it's never going to work. So we have to figure out where, you know, how do we how do we do that? Recommendations there. Figure out where you've used data in the past. Look at your past work papers. Where are you already using data, and where can you get maybe some quick wins? Um, you you want to make sure that you're at least taking action. I would go back to your audit plan. You know, where does it make the most sense to you to use analytics? You know, what are your biggest risk areas? What are your biggest audit areas? Where are you spending the most time? Of those areas, what has the best data, and then how can we bring those two things together so we can get more effective and also get started at the same time? We've got to at least take action. It doesn't have to be a huge action. In fact, I would not recommend your first place being somewhere that takes eight months to get going. I would lean more toward eight days. How can you demonstrate value quickly but making sure that you're demonstrating value? From there, we have to figure out how do we get stakeholders on board. Uh, you know, we're going to get a lot of challenges. You know, the cost of the software, the cost of training, the you know, getting people. You know, we don't have the right people, so we're going to have to go hire people. It's going to take time to get people started, and obviously, it's going to take time to maintain our knowledge level. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to have costs. And a lot of times, that's the lens that is viewed through at the beginning. What we need to figure out is how can we reframe that cost as an investment. Uh, you know, it's not an expense, but it's an investment in time. One of the best applications of this, I've got an organization I work with here locally, they quantify every dollar they can that they've saved the organization both in cost and in the time of their team, labor costs of their internal audit program. So they say if the audit took us 20 hours last year, it took us four hours this year, 
what are those 16 hours worth in labor costs and communicate that back to management. Say, look, we saved this much time. Um, you know, the, the overall costs are an investment because we're, you know, we've spent 30,000, we've saved the organization 500,000 through a variety of different ways. You can see the investment there. You know, look for those easy win analytics where you can actually detail out the costs or cost savings. Duplicate payment recovery is one of those common areas. Uh, it's not necessarily a huge fraud risk, but it is a risk in organizations, and it's also an area where a lot of organizations pay a considerable amount of money, um, you know, to get work done. Uh, so if you can use that, uh, you know, purchasing cards is another quick area uh, where you can typically find some waste and abuse pretty quickly and demonstrate that back to management. But you've got to communicate in the terms of the stakeholders. What is it that's important to them, and how can you now reframe this within their context to show them why it's so important. The next area that I think uh, we'd definitely be remiss if we didn't talk about this, and that's IT challenges. And we've all probably felt like the gentleman on the screen before when working with IT. And for what it's worth, uh, IT has probably felt this way working with us as well. Uh, but one of the biggest challenges as it relates to IT is communication. You know, getting the actual data itself and working with IT to communicate with them on what it is that we need and why we need it and how often we need it is a challenge. There are some other challenges out there as well, data quality, data security and access, processing power of our machines. Um, those are issues, but typically they're, they're, you know, they take a backseat to the issue of communication. Uh, my recommendations as it re you know, relates to working with and overcoming the IT challenges, you've got to start with mutual respect. We all, we all think that you should be able to hit export in quicker than three weeks, but inevitably it takes that long. You know, we have to understand that our request isn't their only request. There are other things going on. Uh, we need to start with mutual respect. From there, we need to communicate early and really often. Um, you know, talk with them about what it is that we're looking to accomplish, how it's going to benefit them. You know, if they have something that's automated to get us the data or an ODBC connection directly, we don't have to have their time every month. But how can we, you know, again, frame it through their context? And then the other thing is really, you know, take one of your team members. One of the best examples of dealing with IT challenges came from a university that I talked to down in Texas. They cross-trained one of their younger I. Uh, younger audit staff members on their IT system, soon as the same training as their IT department did, and they essentially then had a translator, somebody that could actually speak IT and speak accounting, and that, that's, a, that's a challenge to be bilingual in both accounting and IT, but it allowed them to then communicate with IT and then for IT to communicate back with them, and that organization had great success in getting the data that they needed. I'd highly encourage uh, that model. You're also going to have to uh, you're going to have to deal with the challenges that are you know a traditional culture within an organization. And historically, we've been very reactive in our approaches. We've relied on gut instinct and what we already know, so to speak. You know, we just know it because we've been around forever. Um, people are going to be resistant to change as well as it relates to changing uh, their methodology rather than going off what they know and the standard reports. You know, you go to a 100% analysis and getting the really hard data out there that may prove contrary to what people think, there's going to be resistance. There's also going to be resistance in the fact that people don't know what the data can even do. And it's really up to us to prove and provide education around the value that data can bring to an organization. You know, talk to other universities. Figure out what they've done that has worked and use that as a case study. You know, go out to Automation or Ideas web or Caseware's website and figure out how are other organizations using it. Demonstrate that back to them. There are a whole host of websites out there that you can go to beyond that that you can find case studies of analytics and higher ed. You know, use those to help help teach people and educate people um, that data can provide a ton of value to them. As you do that, do what you can to make the data personal. How is it directly going to benefit each and every individual in your organization, and how can you communicate that with them? The more you can make it personal, the more they're going to really strive to change the way that they behave. And then finally, don't hide the data behind the scenes. When you're providing feedback to somebody and you're explaining to them what you did and why it worked, show them that the data 
helps get you to that answer. Don't make it a black box that nobody can see because then people don't recognize it and they just think that you can just push a button and it's done. Do you need to show them a snapshot of the million transaction database that you use to get them where they want to be? It doesn't necessarily have to mean, mean that you explain all million rows to them, but it shows them the, you know, the context within which you found the data and the useful pieces of information, and it helps them understand the value of what you're doing from an analytics standpoint. Finally, you've got to find the right team. Um, you know, again, these may be individuals internally. They may be individuals that you're bringing in. The same for hiring analytics professionals goes as for hiring any professional in your organization. They've got to be a right fit culturally first. They may be the best data scientist out there, but if they don't fit on your team or in your organization, it's not going to work, and we need to recognize that up front. Again, we're looking for both technical skills as it relates to the business process area or the, you know, the business that you're in, or the technology skills and knowledge. Find somebody that can use the technology really well and pair with somebody who's technically very sophisticated and you have a very powerful team. And the more that you can collaborate and have the right team that can work together to solve problems, the better off that you're really going to be at the end of the day. Now before we move on to some of the common questions that we get as it relates to what organizations want to know around analytics. Lindsay, I'm going to bring you back in for our second polling question, please. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, our second confirmation word is audit. So please go ahead and select audit from the list of words. Again, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. You must complete all three of the poll questions in order to receive CTE credit. So um, definitely make a point to select audit. I'll give you about 10 more seconds. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn this back to you. All Thank right. you, Jeremy. Thank you. Must, everybody must be uh, quite attentive. These are some quick polling questions, so that's good. So some yeah, of the common questions, <laughs> yeah, I was about to say that, that's outstanding. So some of the common questions that organizations ask, and uh, I've spoken at a few different conferences this year uh, in a variety of industries, uh, including higher education, and it seems like the same questions always come back up as it relates to analytics. And probably the first one that I get is, what's the best place to start? And I would love to say that the answer is going to be the same across industries, across organizations, but it's not even the same across organizations within the same industry for that matter. And really the best place to start is going to be what is the, what is the strategic question that you are most looking to answer in your organization. I started off the webinar talking about the importance of a strategic question, and that really ties back to what's the best place for you to start. Whether it's your biggest pain point in the organization, whether it's your organization's biggest goal that you're looking to achieve, whether it's in a specific process area and you have one problem that you're trying to solve, or if you go back to your internal audit plan for the year, you know, what are your highest risk areas? That is the best place to start, is looking at what is truly important to your department, you individually, or your organization, and then from there determining where can I use analytics or how can I use analytics to accomplish these goals or address these pain points or address these risks. One of the things that's really important is we don't want analytics to be in addition to everything else that you're doing. I have yet to meet an auditor that has extra time on their hands and they're just looking for something to fill that time. Most everybody has enough to do as it is. We don't want to add something to what we're doing. So the best place to start it is a place that you're already working on, that you're already focused on, that you're already trying to address, where you can really make analytics part of that process and really drive home the value of it and start to change the culture of your organization. That's going to be the best place to start. I can provide some guidance as it relates to fraud risks. You know, most of the common fraud risks out there in higher education uh, do deal. Uh, with billing, expense reimbursements, corruption is pretty common. So in accounts payable, purchasing cards, and payroll, we see a lot of the schemes. So if you're focused on fraud, for instance, 
it would be what's the scheme that's most relevant for you. Uh, as it relates to some of the highest quality data, the great thing about higher education when you get into some of the academic data, that's going to be some of the best data that's out there. If you're looking financial, anything that comes directly from the bank, so your purchasing cards, your corporate credit cards, probably one of the most common places that I see organizations apply analytics from an audit context in higher education is purchasing cards. Because they are higher risk, they may be immaterial, but they typically keep most people up at night. Uh, so maybe that's right for you. But again, it's going to be an evaluation that you have to make yourself. The next mo most common question, and this kind of goes back to some of the challenges that we've talked about, is how do I get management buy-in? And the most successful approach that I have seen in getting management buy-in is really reframing the analytics program itself through the context of what's most important to management. And that's going to vary at different levels. The president of the university is probably going to have a different level of what's important than, say, the, the CFO or the, the controller or the director of accounting or the director of accounts payable or the director of uh, academics or athletics. You really have to frame up what you're doing through the context of management. Now, the overall application of analytics that may be something that you, you have to sell at the highest level first. You may have to go at the CFO level. But really to get management's overall buy-in, the more that you can take it on an analytic by analytic, business process by business process basis, and get that support and buy-in at the middle levels first, the easier it's going to be to get the higher levels of buy-in because you're essentially going to have a group of evangelists that are out there talking about how wonderful the analytics that the auditors are running for them are and how great they are at helping their department. So the more that you can get the buy-in at that level first and really you know, get the word spread through others in addition to yourself, the more that you have others talking about it, it's going to help you get that buy-in with management. The next has to be IT. I just can't communicate with them. What do I do? And as I mentioned, this is an area that I, we've all been frustrated with uh, from time to time, some more than others. Again, the first thing is to step back and realize working with IT is like working with any other department in the organization. You have to have mutual respect. They have their set of priorities, and your requests are probably not at the top of their list every single time. They may be. The more that you can work with them to identify who is a single point of contact that you can work with routinely that understands what you're doing, understands the importance, that can help you really in, you know, interact with IT and get things prioritized appropriately. Getting a liaison with IT can really help you. The more that you can understand what it is that they're doing, what their priorities are, what their system is, and uh, you know, understand really when you go to them with a request, have an understanding of your system. Have an understanding of the underlying tables and fields, the security measures that are out there. You know, really come in with that context and that understanding so you come at it from their vantage point as well. So you're not just coming in as someone that wants the data. But you come in with, here, here's what we're looking for. Here are the challenges. Here are the security risks. Here are all of these things. We've addressed that. Here are our solutions. What more information do you need, and how can we move forward to get this data to us within that context is really going to help you uh, communicate better with, ID, uh, with IT. Uh, one of the other most common questions is, can I use IDEA for fraud prevention and detection? And, and by all means, yes. Uh, fraud prevention and detection is actually is the area that I got my start in. It's still the most common area that I see data analytics uh, applied within organizations as much as I talk with organizations about the other uses of analytics, of which there are many, obviously. That's pretty well anywhere we have data and we have a strategic question. Fraud prevention and detection is still probably the number one most requested application of analytics that I see day in and day out. Uh, I was talking with Lindsay earlier, and you know, I helped teach uh, the data analytics course for the ACFE, the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. And time and again, that, that is a full course. They offer it multiple times a year. 
And that's one of the biggest areas where individuals are looking to apply this technology is within the areas of fraud prevention and detection. Uh, the great thing about most of those areas is you're going to have data. And when you have that data, uh, that's going to be a way that you can very easily apply uh, apply the technologies and you know fraud prevention and detection it works out really great you know that is an area where you do have uh, you do have you know very specific questions that you're trying to answer do I have employees related to my vendors so let's go in and do an employee vendor match on name address tax ID number phone number bank account number and any other identifiable attribute and now at that point you know we can start to identify conflicts of interest related parties uh, potential corruption schemes and other unknown relationships that are in there. And that's a very useful application, but uh, IDEA can most definitely be used for fraud prevention and detection. In the auditing space, it's probably one of the most popular areas that I still be, see it being applied. So let's move forward to the application framework and how can we actually get from what we've just talked about conceptually to the actual hard results. And as I mentioned uh, in the slides, there will be some bonus content that I'm not going to go through here. It's very text-heavy slides, but it provides you a framework, or it provides you this framework applied to some specific fraud risks that are out there and other tests that I see a lot of organizations doing. The first thing we have to do is figure out, do we even have a good opportunity to identify or to apply analytics? Got to have three things. It has to be viable, it has to be valuable, and it needs to be vital as well. So from a viability standpoint, do we even have data that can help us answer the strategic question that we're after? Because we don't have data, it's really hard to apply data analytics. I know that goes without saying, but I see it from time, you know, from time to time. So does it even make sense that this is something that we can solve with data analytics? Do we have the data? Secondarily, is it valuable? I mean, if this isn't going to actually provide value back to our organization, we probably don't want to spend the time to go out there and try to automate it. We want to make sure that we are providing value to our organization uh, and that it's really doing something above and beyond what we're already doing, which leads us to our last item, which is vital. If we have a process that already works as well as it can possibly work, and technology is not key to improving it and making it better, we don't need to add to technology just for the sake of adding technology. I don't think anybody, like I said, is looking to do things just for fun. Don't get me wrong, I, I'm probably one of the biggest nerds around. I could analyze data just for fun and, you know, end the day happy. But if it isn't actually vital to success, to success and adding value to our organization, there's really no point in doing it. We want to make sure that it's viable, it's valuable, and it is uh, the technology is vital to success. From there, our framework starts with what we've been talking about this entire way. What is our strategic question? Maybe we're trying to understand how do two different variables relate to each other? Are they correlated in any way? And if so, we need to say that is our strategic question. We're trying to figure out how A and B are related. Once we have that strategic question, then we have to figure out next, what are the objectives that we have to meet to actually be able to answer that strategic question? Uh, some strategic questions are going to be very specific, and maybe it's just one objective because it's that specific. Maybe they're more broad, and there are 15 or 20 objectives that need to be met to fully answer that strategic question. And if that's the case, we need to have those spelled out so we know where we're going, because once we have our objectives, then we need to go obtain the data that we need to actually meet those objectives. We need to think about the objectives that we uh, are going to actually answer or the data that we actually need to analyze to answer the objective. We also then need the data that we're going to use for the follow-up after the fact. We need to make sure that we have both of those sets of data so that we can actually, uh, so that we can effectively uh, meet those objectives and then answer that strategic question. Once we have the data, we're back to what we're, uh, we kind of started talking about here at the beginning, and that's our procedures, right? We're talking about analytics. What are the analytics we're going to run? Uh, and what are those procedures? There is a bit of a uh, structure to this that I will uh, that I will go through. The first thing that we do in procedure development is not turn on the idea script recorder. Though I've had individuals ask me, "What do I do now that it's on?" And if that's your next question, your best answer is turn it off, because you want to figure out how to do one procedure and how to do one procedure really well. That's clicking through the icons, clicking through the menus, answering the questions 
building it out in a non-automated fashion, making sure that it works. Once we know that it works, then we can go to automated individual procedures. We then record the idea script that will help us accomplish that one procedure. Once we have that one procedure, we go develop another one, get it working really well and automate it, and another, and another, and another. And then from there, we get into the automated groups. And so instead of actually clicking a button to run one, we click a button to run 20 different groups of or 20 different individual procedures that are all working toward a common objective or a common strategic question. And then finally, we get to the continuous analytics. That's not the starting point. That's actually the last step of procedure development is fully, autom fully automating a system of analytics and getting to continuous analytics. We want to make sure that that's not what we try to automate day one, that we get the procedures working first, then we automate them down the road. As I mentioned, effectiveness, then efficiencies. Once we've actually developed our procedures, we're back to the areas that we all are already familiar with from a traditional audit standpoint, and that's analyzing the procedures or the results of our analysis. What do they even tell us? Uh, do we have false positives? I hope you at least have some false positives. Uh, if you don't have false positives, you've probably gotten too narrow in your procedures and we need to open it up a little bit. But what do the false positives tell us? How can we learn from that and make the procedures better? Have we answered or have we met our objectives and answered our overall strategic question? Once we have analyzed those results and determined that, now we can go in and actually manage the results. How are we going to use them in the greater context of the business process, within our audit, within our organization? And once we do that, then we can go back and start the process all over again. And it's one that continues as we continue to evolve our analytics and the use of analytics within our organization. Now before I get into some closing thoughts and answering some of the questions that we have, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Lindsay, for the final polling question today. Thanks, Jeremy. Our final confirmation word is ACUA, so please select ACUA. Um, this is our last polling question, so you need to have completed all three to receive your CPE. Um, and I'm just going to preemptively say thank you, Jeremy, for sharing with us today. And um, I think we've got a lot of good interaction and some good questions. So um, good to go. And I'll give you guys a few more seconds to respond. See if we can get everybody. <laughs> <laughs> everybody wants that CP. Exactly. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back to you for closing remarks. Thank you. All right, thanks, Lindsay. All right, so some of the closing thoughts. Um, we'll talk about, you know, just kind of a recap of some of the keys to success and then how do we prepare for the future. And then I'll hit some of the questions that I know uh, that folks have uh, asked along the way. An overall recap of the keys to success. You know, if you can find a champion in your organization to spearhead this. You know, we talked about you've got to have a vision and a clear approach, you know, clearly indicated goals and, and a good team. It's going to take a person uh, that's really going to champion that, that for you and really drive this forward. If nobody owns it and really champions the process, it's going to be hard to overcome some of the challenges and achieve some of those key elements for success. Once you do that, you're going to have the buy-in. You're going to be able to get, you know, that person is going to help develop that plan. Uh, you want to integrate this, as I mentioned, into what it is that you are doing. Make it part of your culture and really drive home the value of it. Uh, you want to make sure that you can have defined standards so you can measure success, as I mentioned earlier. Be able to turn that around and quantify that in terms that management is used to and looking for. You're going to have to dedicate resources to it. Uh, you're not going to have success if you simply say, hey, we bought IDEA, now we have analytics and go. It's not reality, it's not realistic. You're going to have to dedicate resources to it and actually make a conscious effort to make it part of what you do. I talked with some great organizations that use IDEA and they actually have deliberate planning steps dedicated to the use of IDEA. Uh, within their audits, and that is something that has become very critical to them, but it's also helped them really make it part of what they do and get them success, some success. Last key to success that I'll leave you with is you've got to be thinking to the future. You know, how are you going to plan for when that person may leave your organization? Hopefully they are around until they retire and you don't have to worry about it, but 
in the event that they decide to go elsewhere, you don't want all of your institutional knowledge and all of your analytics knowledge going out the door with them. What can you do to plan ahead and develop a plan that's going to allow you to do that in the future? As it relates to preparing for the future, uh, some other things to keep in mind. Failure in an analytic is going to happen. You're going to design an analytic that you thought was spectacular, the most awesome thing out there, going to get you all the answers, and it's going to fall flat and it's not going to do it. That does not mean that you failed. What that means is that that analytic failed, perhaps. It did not accomplish what the objectives were, but you know what? You learned from it. Now you can go back and refine it and develop a better analytic to better you know, accomplish those goals meet those objectives and answer that strategic question. You have to accept that that's part of it. If you wait till you have the perfect analytic, you'll never get started because it doesn't exist. You've got to accept the fact that it may not work. You're probably not going to hear many people tell you as auditors that you need to be creative. It's not something that's encouraged in our accounting degrees. But really when it comes to the use of analytics in our organizations, especially in audit, and as it relates to fraud risk as well, you have to be creative. You have to think about new ways to use the data that haven't been thought about before so that you can get a quick success. You may have to create what you need from a data standpoint. You may not have it today. That doesn't mean you can't have it tomorrow. Start to capture the data that you need. Start to quantify it and collect it and figure out how to get the data that you need to address the risk that you can use analytics on it in the future. That's going to go beyond just numbers. Now, I've heard a lot of you know, individuals in higher education say, well, we can't touch the academic data because this, we don't have debits and credits. Well, it may not be numbers, but A, B, C, D, or A, B, C, D, and F, those can be, those are, they're letters, yes, but they can be quantified. They can be analyzed qualitatively. Analytics doesn't just apply to numbers. It can apply to attributes and characteristics as well. And that's the last point on preparing for the future is you've got to start thinking beyond the financials. The structured data that's within your accounting system is likely only 10 to 20 percent of the data that you've got out there today. How are we going to use the other 80 to 90 percent of the data out there that's unstructured, that's beyond just the numbers, and actually bring that in in a way that's going to help us use analytics more successfully in our organization and truly drive home the value that we really think that we can drive home using analytics? With that, I mentioned resources. I'm going to put my contact information on the screen, email, phone number, website, Twitter, LinkedIn. I love to share information and interact with folks on the use of analytics, whether it's in higher education or any aspect of any industry. Uh, I just love talking about analytics and sharing ideas with you. Um, I lead the big data in analytics and digital forensics practices here at BKD. Uh, you know, we work with organizations on either providing analytics or helping them figure out how to use the analytics. Uh, you know, we work with automation and idea quite a bit as well. So if there's any questions that I can help answer right now, I would love to do so. If you want to reach out to me after the fact, uh, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Some of the questions that have come in so far, um, one of the questions, what is the best way to find correlation in the data? And that's, my recommendation there, there is a correlation feature with an idea, but I think it's important to actually evaluate the data before you even try to use that tool or that process because simply clicking the button and seeing if it's correlated doesn't necessarily help get you there. Uh, one of the things that you need to do is understand the data and understand what drives the data. It's very important in regression and correlation analysis that you have a dependent variable and an independent variable and you really need to evaluate your data to determine what are those. Um, and once you understand that, then you can start to evaluate how they maybe correlate together. But it starts with a really clear understanding of the data as well. Let's see. I think we've hit quite a few of the others. Uh, one question was any, you know, the last question here that I'll address unless others come in. You know, any of the specific analytical models which have been useful, successful, or surprising uh, from an analytical model standpoint, um, I can't think of any specific models. We're seeing a lot of traction with using unstructured data in social media, especially in higher education. Very helpful at evaluating reputational risk. Uh, contrary to popular belief, some of that can actually be accomplished within IDEA. 
Uh, it uses uh, some of the uh, other tools as well, like Python and R. Uh, but building out a model that addresses sentiment and emotional tone and topic mapping within reputational or text-based data is a very popular model. Uh, the Benford's analysis is one that I know everybody's probably familiar with. I would encourage you to look at that. I can't say necessarily that I have specifically found fraud with Benford's, uh, but I have made some very interesting, uh, had some very interesting findings that have helped organizations better understand their data using it. And I think that if you use it properly by setting clear expectations beyond just conformity with the law, uh, that's a very beneficial model as well. With that, if there are any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I would be more than happy to connect with you on social media and answer any questions or provide you any resources that are helpful. If we can be of any assistance to you outside of that as well, uh, by all means reach out. But thank you for attending today. Lindsay, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate you inviting me to present. I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for sharing um, your expertise with us. At the end, um, when we close out the webcast. There will be a short evaluation. Please share your uh, thoughts and um, we appreciate your feedback. And um, we try to do these webcasts with ACUA and ICF quarterly. So um, if you have an interest in case study or you want to share some of your expertise with our ACUA audience, we would love to have you as a speaker for one of our quarterly uh, special interest groups. Please um, let me know if you're interested in learning more about being a speaker. I can be emailed at marketing at automation.com. Um, again, thank you for joining us, and thank you, Jeremy, and everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you.